People send me proposed false friends all the time, words in the King James that just look so odd, something weird has to be going on. But they aren't all necessarily false friends. I am often derailed from my work, I must confess, though I can do this really quickly now when somebody sends me an interesting example. And I just got one from Martin Chamberlain, who's one of my many Patreon supporters. Shout out to my Patreon supporters. Martin saw in Ezekiel thirteen eighteen something that he thought just had to be a false friend. Here it is, Logos Bible Software, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Woe to the women that so pillows to all armholes. The margin here says, or elbows, and that is indeed what the Hebrew says there, and make kerchiefs upon the head of every stature to hunt souls. This is obviously obscure. (laughs) It is not obvious right off the bat whether pillows is a false friend or not. And I don't want to admit any false friends into my little pantheon, very, very lowercase, like subscript P for pantheon there, uh, unless I've done the proper work. It's only a false friend if the misunderstanding that we get is caused by language change. It's only a friend, a false friend if there is a misunderstanding. Let's find out what's going on here. Why did they use the word pillows? Well, the very first thing that I did was I searched in the good old Oxford English Dictionary, and I can do it like so, O for Oxford English Dictionary, and then I type pillow and I won't show you my login. I am already logged in. I look at the noun form. I'll zoom in just a little bit, and I look down. A support for the head when lying or sleeping, especially a rectangular cushion stuffed with feathers or a soft synthetic material. Well, no, it's not that because that's exactly the way we take the word. So, uh, and that meaning of the word goes way back before the King James. So right off the bat, you know, it's looking actually like at least our sense of the word pillows was possible back then. So sometimes I'll just search for the word obsolete on the page. Was it a surgical pad or dressing, a pledget? That was apparently maybe possible back in those days in 1611. I'm really not certain. But the other obsolete uses are nautical, nautical. Let's see, there's another one. The pad of a saddle, a pillion, rare after the 17th century. None of these are fitting the context that we have in Ezekiel 18, which is about false prophets, about women who are apparently engaged in some kind of uh, false profiting, you know, false prophesying, some kind of witchcraft maybe. Almost seems like a little bit something like voodoo, and this is what Ezekiel is being called upon by the Lord to condemn. So right off the bat, I'm pretty sure it's not a false friend, because there isn't a sense of pillow that they had back then that we have now. And I could stop here, but I wouldn't be a philologist, a lover of words, if I did. So let me show you the process that I continued with. I started by looking at all of the other commentaries, I'm sorry, not commentaries, translations I have in the text comparison window in Logos Bible software. And I see, ah, uh, this is so funny. Here's Martin emailing me back after I just responded to him. I just figured I'd just jump right in and do a little screencast here. Uh, woe to the women who sew magic bands. And what we're going to find is that pillows is the older uh, rendering. And even the MEV goes with magic bands. The New King James goes with magic charms. The NASB magic bands, the NIV, probably magic, oh, magic charms, Uh, the TNIV, magic charms, magic bands, and the CSB, pretty obviously modern translations are going with something different, usually magic bands or magic charms, rather than pillows, and that is a rather big difference. Sometimes when you go looking into these things, you actually find out that pillow used to be able to mean magic band, and then you know you have a false friend. You got to confirm it in the Hebrew, And actually, that is the next step. I am going to go to the Hebrew. I can just use the uh, text comparison tool to click on it. This is the Lexham Hebrew Bible. All texts that are used in, uh, in Hebrew Bible study pretty much are Masoretic texts anyway. And I look for that particular word. We're in an obscure portion of scripture and, um, It can be difficult to follow along, but here it is, and I can look it up with the Bible word study, and I find out it appears only these two times right in this passage. Wherefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I'm against your pillows, wherewith ye there hunt the souls to make them fly, and I will tear them from your arms, and will let the souls go, even the souls that ye hunt to make them fly. Very, very obscure. Okay, I'm not at all surprised that there's some confusion, as we'll see, surrounding this word. When I look up the word in 
halot, the standard top Hebrew, Aramaic, and lexicon of the Old Testament, that is a Hebrew English dictionary, I am getting the possibility that in modern Hebrew it is a cushion. That's what em heb means. But this is questionable. It's more likely a loan word from Akkadian kasitu, means bondage from kasu to bind, and therefore bands, magic bands. Okay, so where were they getting pillow? Well, number one, in modern Hebrew, it's cushion. And so that's one potential source. Um, modern Hebrew may extend back a little uh, before the 1948, you know, Zionism era into medieval Hebrew. Here's Martin Chamberlain again. Um, uh, let's, though, look at another source of information that I often go to. And here I am in the text comparison window. Um, I have, oops, it didn't show up. Oh, I forgot to save that. Well, take a look at the Vulgate. Often I will find that a, a given word in the King James, when it's something really obscure like this, follows the Vulgate. And sure enough, oh man, just looking at it makes me think that's got to be it. Pull Velos. Come on, boy, I wish I could not have notifications. Now you know I have a Walmart delivery coming to my house. Pull Velos, that sure sounds like it's going to be pillows, but let's look it up. I don't actually have the uh, um, Oxford Latin Dictionary in my own copy of Logos, so I'm going to have to use it in my um, uh, employee copy of Logos where I have access to everything. Ooh, it is so nice. And sure enough, I already looked it up for us. Puwilus is a small cushion or pillow. Um, uh, there could be a pillow of earth, a small raised bed of earth, but clearly this is consistent with what the King James translators chose. And so right off the bat, I'm thinking maybe they just followed the Vulgate. They do that sometimes with difficult words like this. But then I thought to myself, well, we've also got to check the Greek translation of the Old Testament that we call the Septuagint. And I will often use the Septuagint with Logos morphology. Thus says the Lord, woe to the, that's an obscure word. Uh, um, that is, oh, those who sow, and here's our word, proskephalia, proskephalia. Um, I apologize, I don't usually pronounce Hebrew and Greek words on the channel. I want this to be accessible to people who speak only English. But necessarily, we're getting into some obscurities here in order to ferret out the meaning of a difficult word. And if I look up that word, that Greek word in the um, uh, Lexham, I'm sorry, the LSJ, the Little Scott Jones Dictionary, which is one I'll tend to use for the Septuagint. We don't really have an excellent Septuagint lexicon for English, but this is good enough. Sure enough, they give it cushion for the head and pillow. And the word uh, head in Greek is in here, kephalion. And the, uh, the prefix pros can just mean to the, and that's a way they construct a lot of their words. And then by convention, the to the head means pillow. Okay, so the King James translators and whoever else it was that was sticking with pillow, uh, one of those older um, translations, I can't remember now, was it the uh, the Bishop's Bible? What is GB? I forget now. This is terrible that I've forgotten this. This is the Geneva Bible. Duh. Yeah, they stick with pillows. Okay, um, they have gone with the Vulgate and the Septuagint. Uh, and with modern Hebrew, and it turns out, I did some other checking into this, they've gone with modern rabbis. But actually, when I come to this kind of spot in my philological study, more and more I like this word philologist for myself, I'm recognizing I don't have the facility with all of the different eras of Hebrew that are necessary to ferret all this out, so I want to hear from a commentator, and I'll toss this passage into my Logos passage guide. It brings up a bunch of my different commentators, and I'm going to look for a more recent, more technical commentary like Daniel I. Block, 1997, in the Nikot series. And sure enough, he says, it is impossible to arrive at a clear understanding of the women's methods. These are the false prophets that Ezekiel is inveighing against because of the obscurity of the expressions used. Nevertheless, two specific, specific activities appear to be involved. First, they are sewing something for people's arms. Since the Hebrew words here, kesatoth, uh, kisetoth, appear only here and in verse 20, 
its meaning is uncertain. Um, if that bothers you to, to think that a word is uncertain in the Hebrew, just give me a minute to explain. Um, one's first impulse is to associate the term of the verb uh, with the verb kasa to cover, and that is a common Hebrew verb. Um, though the Septuagint has proskaphalia, which I showed you, pillows, and the, he's saying this goes a different direction. Let me move my face over here now and keep going here. This, uh, they, go in, they go in a different direction, one that continues in Tanaitic Hebrew, and he's got a footnote here that talks about loan words from Ugaritic. Um, he talks, he's actually referencing here the same loan words that are mentioned in Halot that we already looked at, and he has a footnote pointing you to Jastro's dictionary and to the Targums, which translate uh, this into Aramaic, I believe they're Aramaic Targums, and into dark black patches, which isn't pillows, and it isn't magic bands either. Or maybe it is magic bands, something like bands. We've got a number of options within the interpretive history of this word. That's the important thing to know right now. Um, then he goes on, he prefers, since some form of magical power is involved here, it seems best to associate the singular form of the noun keset with the Akkadian verb kasu to bind and the noun kasitu binding magic. Okay, so here's, here's what's important to recognize here. Um, modern commentators and modern translators are not just saying, hey, here's something that makes sense, let's stick that meaning in. No, they have to have some evidence for it. So they're looking to uh, other Semitic languages like ancient Ugaritic and um, uh, Arabic and Ge'iz and other languages, and they're they're trying to see if there's a parallel word that fits in somebody's calling me. Actually, that was a call from the guy that uh, may possibly be editing some of my videos in the future. My Indian editor fell through. And that's actually a bit of a problem because I really do struggle to get these videos not just scripted, although this one is not scripted if you can tell, but also shot and then edited. I mean, color corrected audio stuff. I'm not good at audio stuff. I'm so sorry about that. I'm trying to learn and I'm trying to get some more help after my Indian editor fell through. Anyway, let's get back to the discussion. We've got here um, so a reference to other languages, to loan words from other languages, to cognate languages. And, and again, I'm saying well, modern translators, modern uh, commentators are not just making something up. They're not willing to do that. This is really, really important. We don't just say, as you know, modern biblical scholars, uh, uh, among whom I can't really count myself. Again, I just am sort of a popularizer, but I understand what they're doing. We can't just say, oh, hey, this meaning seems to fit. Let's use it. There's got to be a reason, and here there is. This is therefore considered a reference being, being to magical bands worn on the wrists and arms by these women. That is why so many modern translations go with that option against the option of the King James and the Latin Vulgate and the Greek Septuagint, which is actually prior to Christ. And that's powerful evidence, right? I mean, uh, Jerome himself lived a lot closer to the time of the Hebrew Bible when this would have been written in Ezekiel than we do, but he was still many centuries afterward. The Septuagint is that much closer, and that's why it gets so much weight. But modern commentators and lexicographers and, and people like me living today, we do tend to instead want to look to loan words. And I'm not a master of that. I don't know Ugaritic. But I can follow the basic argument that uh, a cognate language has something that seems to fit, and so let's try that. Um, he says, uh, Block says in the Nicot series, which is a great one to have, by the way, for this exact kind of reason. However, some argue that these bands were also put on the wrists of their victims so these women could maintain control over them by means of sympathetic magic. So we've got some real uncertainty here, and I think that bothers a lot of people. I actually want to talk about that for a little bit. If that bothers you, let me first say I understand. And I think it ought to be a little bit of a concern to us, right? That there's a word in the Bible, any word in the Bible, even something as obscure as this, where overall you get the gist, you know, whatever these women are doing is very bad and God condemns it. It has something to do with false prophecy or magic or something. Um, we know it's bad, but we don't know what it is. Isn't that odd? And to me, one of the reasons I say this very soberly and carefully, I'm, 
I just have to speak the truth, my brothers and sisters out there. One of the reasons I don't accept the doctrine, uh, so, so called, of the perfect preservation of the Hebrew text of the Old Testament and the Greek text of the New is that it seems awfully odd to me that God would promise us to promise to give us every word, every single jot and tittle, you know, none missing or added, and all in the right order. That seems to be the way that this doctrine is put forth by people who defend the exclusive use of the King James, or at least of the Textus Receptus and Masoretic text. One of the reasons I don't accept that is that it makes little sense to then go on and say that, to have to acknowledge, as we must, that there are words whose meaning God has not preserved. What's the point of preserving the words perfectly if we don't know what they all mean? And if that unsettles you, let me point you to somebody else who has some wise words on this. And this is where my mind often goes. I'm going to move my face over again, and I'm going to, in Logos, ooh, I've got it uh, a little bit different than I usually have it because, oh, come on, come on, Logos. I, uh, I have increased the size of my screen for your sake, and that's why I, you can't see my shortcut to this book, but you'll see it in a second, the New Cambridge Paragraph Bible. I reference it frequently. Here we go. The New Cambridge Paragraph Bible, I'll move this over onto this side, has uh, a slightly updated spelling, and it's a carefully edited version that pushes the King James back toward the 1611. This was done about 20 years ago by David Norton, I would say right at 20 years ago. And in the preface, preface to, come on, come on, in the preface to the King James Bible written by the translators, translators to the reader, there is this comment. And let me make it bigger so you can see it. I've brought this up several times on the channel before. I'm actually going to extend this so it can be nice and big. And I'm going to make my face go all the way over here so you can see it all. Okay. In this very passage, the King James translators have a footnote, uh, not on this word that we've been focusing on, but on another one, giving another option. And some, peradventure, would have no variety of senses to be set in the margin, lest the authority of the scripture for deciding of controversies by that show of uncertainty should somewhat be shaken. Do you understand that? You can see how, because the Bible is going to be, and is, the standard of doctrinal fidelity and of moral and ethical life, if it speaks with an uncertain sound, you can't use it to decide controversies. So we shouldn't, in our translations, they are quoting somebody else saying, we shouldn't in our translations provide options. But we hold their judgment not to be so sound in this point. For though whatsoever things are necessary are manifest, that's the doctrine of the clarity of Scripture, that goes all the way back. They're, they're quoting St. Chrysostom from way, way back when, and Norton gives a nice... Uh, footnote here, the, the King James translators did not give footnotes to these. And as St. Augustine said, in those things that are plainly set down in the scriptures, all such matters are found that concern faith, hope, and charity, okay? So the stuff we really need to know is clear. That is the classic Protestant view. Yet for all that, it cannot be dissembled that partly to exercise and wet our wits, partly to wean the curious from loathing of them for their everywhere plainness, you know, partly to keep People who, um, in fact, that word curious almost certainly doesn't mean what, um, what we take it to mean. And I forget what it meant back then. I'd have to look that up. Partly to keep some people from hating the Bible because it's just all so easy. Partly also to stir up our devotion to crave the assistance of God's Spirit by prayer, okay? Partly to drive us to the Lord. And lastly, that we might be forward to seek aid of our brethren by con conference and never scorn those that be not in all respects so complete as they should be, being to seek in many things ourselves, because of all these reasons, it hath pleased God in his divine providence here and there, okay, it's not everywhere, it's just these minor places, to scatter words and sentences of that difficulty and doubtfulness, not in doctrinal points that concern salvation, for in, in such it hath been vouched that the scriptures are plain, but in matters of less moment, that is, of less importance, that fearfulness would better beseem us than confidence. And if we will resolve to resolve upon modesty with St. Augustine, though not in this case, this is obscure, altogether yet upon the same ground, um, melius est dubitare est occultes. It is better to doubt that which is hidden than to uh, strive about things that are uncertain. That's what is in Latin. Of course, they translate it here. It's better to make doubt of those things which are secret than to strive about those things that are uncertain. 
there be many words in the scriptures, okay? I've read a bunch of this. Let's keep going. This is rich stuff. This is just so true. And I'm convinced that telling the truth will help your faith, okay? Hiding this absolute truth that's been hiding in the King James preface all these years in your Bible, perhaps, okay, is not helping you. You need to know this. This is the way God made the world. Telling you the truth cannot hurt you unless you let it, okay? Uh, there be many words in the scriptures which be never found there but once. That's what we're dealing with here. It's found twice, but essentially once in one context. Having neither brother nor neighbor, as the Hebrews speak. I love that. So there aren't any obvious cognates within Hebrew. And it does typically happen in Hebrew, not in Greek. So that we cannot be helped by conference of places. We can't go looking around for other places where this is used to get a tip as to what this word means. Again, there be many rare names of certain birds, beasts, and precious stones, etc. And I would put our word, either translated pillows or magic bands, in this etc. There are many words like this, rare words, concerning which the Hebrews themselves are so divided among themselves for judgment that they may seem to have defined this or that, rather because they would say something than because they were sure of that which they said. Okay, That is what we are dealing with here. The word translated alternately pillows in the King James and in the Vulgate and in the Septuagint, and that's a strong case. I'd be happy with pillows. But because of these cognate languages, we're thinking maybe probably better we ought to call it uh, magic bands, magic armbands maybe, okay? Doesn't it beseem us better uh, when we don't really know what a word means to, to have a marginal note, okay? Or to acknowledge that there is some difficulty here. As St. Jerome Seth of the Septuagint, okay? This... Uh, is their practical result. Now, in such a case, not, the, not a margin, a marginal note, do well to admonish the reader to seek further and not to conclude or dogmatize upon this or that peremptorily, peremptorily, dogmatic, you know, peremptoral, peremptorily dogmatic statements are rife on the internet. For as it is a fault of incredulity to doubt of those things that are evident, okay, just because these difficulties occur in the Bible doesn't mean that salvation by faith is unclear, okay? So to determine of such things as the Spirit of God hath left, even in the judgment of the judicious, questionable, can be no less than presumption. Therefore, St. Augustine saith that variety of translations is profitable for the finding out of the sense of the scriptures, so diversity of signification and sense in the margin where the text is not so clear must needs do good, yea, is necessary." as we are persuaded. And, and here's the big deal here for me. This can't only mean marginal notes in your main and perhaps only translation. It has to be okay then that other translations in these obscure places go with something that is also a viable option. It has to be okay that a preponderance of modern Bible translators doing their very best to just try to represent accurately what God said in some obscure place in the Hebrew that he has preserved for us the text, but not the meaning. It has to be okay for a certain group of, you know, a certain, uh, shall, I, shall I say, set of generations of scholars to differ on balance with an, another generation. The King James and translators themselves did this. Frequently, I think you'll find that they relied on the Septuagint and the Vulgate um, for the meaning of words, and they were that's supposed to be bad in the, you know, two streams hypothesis view in which the Septuagint and the Vulgate are bad, or in the Ruckmanite view in those in which the Septuagint didn't exist. No, the King James translators actually make reference to the Septuagint in their preface, and they clearly, clearly use it, rely on it in various places, at least for the for the meaning of certain obscure words. Um, I've been told recently by a number of commenters, including one of my very best, and I'm just going to name him Wesley Commons. That's a pseudonym. I actually know his real name. I've actually talked to him on the phone twice. He is a kind and generous and um, knowledgeable Ruckmanite. There aren't a whole, whole lot of those that I've run into, but he is one of them. He is pushing me, and I get it. I really get it, to not tell everybody out there, lay people, what goes into the sausage. But I think we have King James onlyism and all the horrible division and all the people telling me I'm not saved because I don't use the King James and all the bus kids who aren't understanding their memory verses completely. I think we have all that because we haven't been forthcoming about what goes into the sausage. And I just have to say, nothing of my knowledge of what goes into the sausage has made me have less faith. For me, my faith is more secure. My faith in scripture is more secure 
watching and understanding the way God did things, knowing that I, I actually don't have to just trust one set of translators, but there are all kinds of great study tools that I can reach out to, and there's a whole history of interpretation that I can reach out to. Many, many very intelligent people having encountered these same difficulties as I have over many centuries, that actually is a great boon to my faith, because these many Christian people, from St. Augustine all the way back to St. Paul himself, who would have dealt with some of these same philological difficulties, okay, and all the way up through to the modern era, through the medieval era, um, these folks who were Christians who were dealing with these passages, who were much, much smarter than me, did not lose their faith because of these very obscure difficulties. The King James translators themselves saw these difficulties, and uh, they were not staggered in unbelief because of them. I hope that my little, uh, not as little as I hoped it would be, I thought this would be a lot quicker, but I hope that my little foray into this one potential false friend, which turned out not to be a false friend, because English language change is not the reason for the difficulty here. I hope that my foray into this will uh, give you some helpful knowledge about how Bible translations are made and why they differ.